I'm glad that you're here tonight. I'm glad that you came to hear what Jesus has to say to you. You're here because the majority of you said, I want to go through a month journey of hearing the void filler, (laughs) hearing the voice of God talk to me in a way that I've never heard him before. I want to go deeper. And I want you to know that Jesus sees you. Jesus sees you. You matter to him. He's walking with you. And I promise you there's a word tonight for you. Whether you're on the side of breakthrough that's looking back at the bondage, or you're right smack in the midst of it and you listen to a testimony like Sarah's and you're almost discouraged. Because some of you faced that. Some of you heard that. And you wanted to be happy for her, but there's a few of you that almost, that made it worse for you hearing that because it discouraged you because you thought, now why can't I have that? I've been praying, I've been fasting, I've been seeking the Lord, and I don't have that. And it's been more than a couple years. This teenager, it's only two years for her, it's been 10 years for me, and I'm still going through this and it's easy to get bitter and even discredit something said like that because it's just too painful to rejoice with someone when you're so much in pain for your own life that's a sermon by the way in of itself it's something to ponder upon but i want you to know that there's hope for you if wherever you're at tonight The word that's about to come forth, I promise you, if you're in this room and you have a pulse, it's relevant for you. You're going to hear this tonight. You're going to go, this was a game changer for me. I pondered upon making this just maybe a two-part, three-part series on Sunday mornings and taking the whole church through it because it's just too rich and I wanted more time to develop it and really pray and, and bathe it in prayer and fasting and that was really what I wanted to do but I felt selfish not to at least give it to you even in the form of a baby tonight. It's not a full-blown adult as a revelation. It needs more time to develop in prayer but it's enough to give you tonight that I believe it's going to affect you for the rest of your life. And so I'm excited to share with you, and I'm excited afterwards to do something with it, with you in prayer. Hey, let's all stand to our feet. If you would, please go ahead and take the hand of the person next to you. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Shepherd Jesus, that you look upon us with compassion. When you see us harassed and helpless as those acting like we don't have a shepherd, you reach out to us because you're more than willing to lead, to feed, to provide, to comfort, to correct. Jesus, you are our good shepherd. You're our shepherd. And because of that, we shall not want. You are more than enough for us. And so we welcome you, Spirit of the living God, even at this moment, to come and break through the deceitful walls at which we build between you and us. Break them down tonight, Lord. Come in and invade every space in our thinking. We love you, God. We love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we welcome your mighty hand to move in this place tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen, amen. Amen.
If you would, open your Bibles up with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Verse 1, the scripture says, six days before Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him, and then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the incense of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple, and we'll use that term loosely, the disciple whom would soon betray him said, that perfume was a month worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. And Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. Stop there. What a story. We're in the house of Lazarus. If there wasn't a reason to rejoice, I don't know what other reason there could be, then someone was dead and now they're alive. Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, are ready for a party. Of course, Martha in true form is being a Karen Russen at her heart, and she is serving. She's a busy bee about the house of the Lord. Martha, on the other hand, she takes the opportunity to display a wisdom that eluded the disciples. Mary understood something the disciples did not. Her focus wasn't so much on life as it was death. She is considering what's to come as they are preparing for something symbolic that spoke of something that was true and right before them in the house of Lazarus. The Passover lamb, the blood was about to be shed, symbolically paving the way for man to be restored to a relationship with God. And yet the lamb of God, the true lamb, was right there in the house of someone who was dead and now is alive. Jesus had told his disciples what was to happen, that he had to die. Peter's response to this message of death, he tried to forbid it, remember? And what did Jesus say when he looked at Peter? Satan, get behind me. Satan does not want us to look at death. He doesn't want us to deal with it. He doesn't want us to see the beauty of what death brings because it's uncomfortable. It's unwanted. It's painful. And we do all we can do to avoid it. Mary understood something much more important. She was ready to look death right in the face and pour out her worship in a way that was pleasing, that caused the room to be filled with this aroma. 
she saw that death was something to be embraced, no matter how terrible it is, how painful it is, that we trust God with that. Do you hear me? And there's some of you that are dealing with that right now. You have relatives that are in hospice care, and it's painful. You're having a hard time dealing with it. But you're choosing out of your will, not your feelings, not your desires, but out of your faith. God, I'm trusting you, and I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to allow the sweet fragrance of death to fill this temple as I worship you. The only way we can truly be a disciple is to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And Jesus came and walked the Calvary Road, folks. He knew what was coming. Mary says, I hear you and I see it and I worship and I submit to it. I'm taking my hair, which was a picture of her glory, and she wipes his feet. What is that? I'm submitting to this walk of death, Jesus, that you're walking and I'm worshiping as I'm submitting to that. Folks, that's discipleship. To be my disciple, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. This message of death and life and blessing that follows, it comes at various forms in different times, but this smell of death, understand the setting. We have Passover, and we have a house of a man who there might have been the grave clothes sitting over there in the corner going, look, there's my mummy racks. Death is something, I'll be honest with you, I've had a difficult time facing in my walk, in my life. My father's money, we, mother, we called her nanny. I have just loved her so much. Still miss her all these years later. And I remember I watched her slowly dying. Losing her mind, losing her memory. Towards the last days, my wife would spend much more time visiting my nanny than I would. Because I was afraid to be close. Because I knew if I continue to stir the waters of intimacy and love, the more painful it would be when I had to face that smell of death. And so I would pull away and then afterwards feel terrible. By the way, she's with Jesus now. Hallelujah. But see, more and more I'm learning to go, wow, God, when something terrible and tragic happens, you're up to something. And I want to see what that is. I can remember a moment of dealing with death that was somewhat put all of us in shock. See, for Mary and Martha, they were dealing with death, and that was a serious 911 for them because Lazarus literally died. But I can think of a 911 we all, at least if we're old enough, can remember. 17 years ago, I remember working at a hardware store. Maybe some of you remember Lindsay's hardware store. <laughs> but I was a young guy working in there, and let me tell you what, that was mind-blowing to me when I was watching these pictures online of these twin towers. These buildings that are 550 tons of steel and concrete, almost 1,400 feet high in the air. And watching this take place, it was September 11th, 2001. Many of you, some of you remember this really terrible day. It was at 8.46 in the morning that Flight 11 from American Airlines from Boston to Los Angeles struck the North Tower. There it was. Remember that? Remember those pictures? When the first tower was struck, people were just like confused. Was this a bomb? I mean, we just don't know what happened. It didn't make any sense. And of course, when the second tower was hit, we realized, wow, we are under attack. 
it was just two hours or an hour and a half later, of course, the other tower was hit. And it only took a few hours before we watched the towers come down. Keep moving forward in those picks, please. Here you go. Literally a war zone. It was 2,977 deaths that day. Some of you in here lost some people that day, I'm sure. Ages between 2 and 85 out of those 3,000, 80% of them were men. Only 18 people were rescued from the rubble out of all those thousands. And yet, there's been some incredible healing and hope. If you look at this plaza today, this is what it looks like today. This is where they have the plaza with a time of devotion and memorial. Continue to move on in those picks. Go to the next one. And as you can see, different names of people. This is where people today, even to this day every year, and you watch it on TV. Matter of fact, when I was in Port Charlotte, the pastor over there at that church we were ministering was actually there in New York when it happened and lost quite a few friends there. And we discussed the whole event in his life and him processing it and having friends that are still dealing with that and finding that hope and that healing, you see. And they go there each year, not to live in the past, but they understand that the only way that I can really see ahead is by looking back. And it's part of a healthy process of healing and development in our lives that we're able to look back without being stuck in the back and we're able to move forward in doing just that. And they have, of course, like museums, they have the, the Ground Zero Museum, and there's the last piece of steel that was taken out. The last piece of steel. It took eight months and 19 days for them to remove all this rubble that took place, all the steel, all this construction. Keep moving on. Of course, there's that very famous piece of steel that was in the midst of all the rubble that they continued to keep. Keep on moving. And there you go, folks. First responders. There was 23 policemen that died during 911, but 343 firefighters that died rescuing. Next slide. Look at that. Look at all those people digging through that. Keep going. Next slide. Those are bodies from people that just jumped out of the windows. That was part of the job of the first responders is finding some of the bodies. It's a miracle they could, people that just jumped out. I found slides of pictures of pieces of bodies and things they pulled out where it was just too much to show you. There's no way I could put that on the screen. Incredible. Can you imagine being, next slide, can you imagine being some one of these first responders going through this for eight months. Eight months going through this. Next slide. I loved this picture here because it was just such an insight and I'm thinking about these port authorities, firemen, police officers, volunteers going through this rubble. Going through this horrific time where they're Breathing in this dust that many of them died from respiratory disease within the first year because of breathing this in or found themselves on medication to this day. But they were willing to go through the rubble. They were willing to go through and expose themselves, right, to something that was just horrid because they wanted to get to that place to moving forward. Remember the first pic I showed you of the Ground Zero Plaza? This beautiful, serene place of therapy? This museum where we can look back and in order to look forward? See, here's the thing. 
there would be no Ground Zero Plaza or museum if there wasn't first responders that spent eight months digging through death to get there. But I find that so often to be the type of disciples that we find ourselves walking as. See, every one of us have a 911, don't we? We have various 911s. Painful events in our life. Times where we've been betrayed, abandoned, lied to, abused, used, sexually molested, taken advantage of every one of us because man is just wicked. This world is wicked and dark. I'm not even getting into the demonic side of it. I'm just talking about man's fleshly sinful nature. That alone is brutal. And all of us have got our gruesome 911 stories. Here's the thing. What we have a tendency to do, the, the, the path of least resistance is this. We have our 911. Our world comes tumbling down and it's, we're in shock. And this is what we desire to do. Move to Hawaii. We want to get out of Dodge. We just want to leave that behind. That's why we get divorced. That's why we break off relationships. That's why we leave churches. That's why we quit jobs. That's why we ignore people's phone calls. Because we just don't want to deal with the carnage of the 911s in our lives. But see, Jesus wants us to be willing as Mary to embrace what's uncomfortable. Even what is seemingly hopeless and God, you've forsaken me to say, God, I know you're into death because without death, there's no life. So if you have me in the midst of something coming down in my life, I'm going to go through the process of picking up the steel and seeing all the muck and the pain and the betrayal and all the stuff it's going to draw out of me. I'll walk through this, Jesus. I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I'll smell the sweet fragrance of death because I know on the other side, God, even though it makes no human sense, there's a resurrection, there's an empty tomb coming. Come on, right? That's what we believe. That's not typical for us. See, here's the thing. When we fast, something's exposed. When we fast, it's kind of like we go through 911. We're in shock. We're hurt. We don't know how to process it. We don't know how to deal with it. So we move to Hawaii. But then we go, That's not you, Holy Spirit. You want me to deal with it. So we get a one way ticket back to New York and we find ourselves in the midst of it. When we fast, that's what we do. Because see, what happens is what's normal for you and for me is when God wants us to deal with the nine one ones in our life because he wants to show himself God in the midst of it, instead of dealing with it, we medicate. When you hear of all the addiction ministries going on in the body of Christ, what do you think that is? It's the same thing that you and I have when we have a workaholic problem. Are we watch too much TV? Are we talk to people instead of talking to God? It's the same stuff. We're trying to fill a void that only Jesus can. And we've got stuff that we've never dealt with because we just went from the day of 911 and we moved to Hawaii and we said someone else can deal with that because I don't want to deal with that. But when you do that, sooner or later, Hawaii wears off, the alcohol wears off, the codependency wears off, and you, got, you get depressed. And you up the ante, you increase those things those addictions because they're not working like they used to. And then after a while, they don't work at all. And that's when you get depressed. Because now you have no control in going to the place that God wants you to go to. Because there'll never be a ground zero museum. There'll never be a serene place of being able to acknowledge and process the past, but yet not be controlled by it and move forward. You've got to be willing to go through those eight months and 19 days. And so often we're just not. Does this resonate with anyone? To be a real disciple, 
is to take up your cross and trust that God will walk this with you. I watched some videos today of 911 footage, and I tell you, I cried a lot. I really did. My heart was broken as I was watching one guy who lost his brother from another fire department, and now he's digging through this stuff, not knowing where his brother's at. How do you do that? Amazing. And, and, and I'm hearing people that are devoted. They're so devoted. Some of these firemen blow my mind, their stories. You can watch documentaries of these people, and you go, this is insane. And they were committed. They were laying down their lives for people. And a lot of them were unbelievers. They don't even know Jesus. They have no hope of an eternal life. And yet they're laying down the one life, and they believe that's all they have. And they're laying it down to rescue somebody. That's mind-blowing to me. Right? I mean, if I die, I know where I'm going. But if I thought this is all there is, would I spend it rescuing a stranger? I don't know. I don't know. And yet we as Christians have a hard time laying down our lives. Even though we know where we're going. Sounds like a conflict, does it not? I believe that God wants you and I to be first responders. First 911 responders. That when something is going on and it's painful and it smells of death, that we can transform it into a time of worship. Isn't that what Mary did? Six days before the death of the Passover lamb in the house of a brother who was dead and now is alive, she's ready to look at him who rescued Lazarus that now is going to die and say, I'm going to fill this house with a sweet fragrance of that I embrace the death that you're going to sovereignly allow for me. And other disciples didn't get it. She was the only one. One up for the sisters, amen? I want to read you another story about someone who embraced death. This isn't six days before Passover, but just four days later. In Mark chapter 14, verse 1, it says, It was now two days before Passover that the festival was a festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and the teachers of the religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the Passover celebration. They agreed, or the people may riot. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon. So he's not at Lazarus' house, he's at Simon, a man who was pre previously had leprosy. So he was as good as dead. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. Does this sound familiar? So they scolded her harshly, but Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. And here 2,000 years later, we're doing just that. I find this story fascinating because I believe that there is a true key to worshiping and bringing about the sweet fragrance of death in our life, which is what fasting is all about. 
Fasting is about a death to you and your will and your desire and confidence in you to fulfill you and saying, God, only you can. And before you bring new power and resurrection life, there has to be some death. And so I'm going to embrace just that. And the only way that happens is when you release something. Do you see what this woman did? Did you see what Mary did? They were releasing something. Do you know that when we fast, we're releasing something? What was she releasing? That which was precious to her. That which gave her security. That which gave her hope. This is part of a dowry. This is part of how I can somehow win over that perfect Boaz in my life and have hope and security and comfort and feel loved. This is if there's a rainy day and some type of famine, will I have a year's full of wages? Jesus says if you want to experience true life, you have to receive death, which means you have to give over whatever you're holding on to. Why do you think he said to the rich young ruler, go sell all you have? We talked about this last week because I'm convinced, he says, you've got to give over that which you find comfort and security in. And when you do that, a sweet, fragrant aroma of death will fill your temple and life will come. But you can't go move to Hawaii when that moment comes. You can't run to your TV set. You can't run to eating. You can't run to drinking. You can't run to religion. You can't run to knowledge. You can't run to the perfect career because there isn't one outside of a kingdom career. Amen? There's nothing you can run to that will fulfill. All it will do will be at best distract for a season, ultimately to leave you depressed. I think that's why Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, because we get tired. I don't know about you. I get tired when I'm trying to fill the void with anything else but the will of God. You're here, family, because you're desiring more. You are looking for a walk with Jesus that reflects what we see in the word of God. If you're in this room, unless maybe you're just visiting tonight, and you're like, what the heck did I walk into? <laughs> but those of you that knew you were coming a week too, you knew what you were getting into. I'm surprised to see this many people come back after that last week. God bless you. I'm impressed. That's amazing because it tells me you really want that sweet fragrance of death in your life. The thing is, as you press in, these next three weeks, I promise you, it's going to get harder before it gets easier. Because see, this is what happens. When we stop distracting ourselves with all the entertainment, all the video games, all the activities, all the stuff, and, and we, we're making a conscious, disciplined choice to not do those things, those severed body parts, those events that God says, I want to show you how I raise the dead through those memories, they're going to be popping up in ways you wish they didn't. And the tendency is to go back to Hawaii. The tendency is to go back to do the things that distracted me from them to begin with. And it's been working for years. Why did I stop now? I think Pastor Dave's crazy. This fast is insane. I'm not under law. I'm under grace. I don't need to do that stuff. Did you hear a snake speak in there? Because that's what that is. That's the enemy trying to rob you from an empty tomb in one or two or more particular areas of your life. And he doesn't want you running the medication. He doesn't want you running the counselor. He, doesn't want, he wants you running to him. He wants you to come to him and say, I realize that, that you want to lead me to the cross because no servant's greater than his master. So, Lord, I'm going to deal with this and I'm going to worship you. What does that mean to worship God in the midst of death? I think it means getting painfully transparent and real with God and allowing those things to come up and say, God, I choose to trust you in that area. I choose to worship you in that area. And that's why I'm convinced more than anything tonight than me, I can say to you 
more fruitful, more transforming, is something God can say to you through someone praying with you tonight, which is something we're going to do every time we meet here on Wednesday nights. We want to pray together. We want to get real together. And at that moment where we break up here shortly, you're at a crossroad because the, the tendency is to go shallow. But if we really want to see the miraculous, then we have to be willing to jump up on that heap of steel and concrete and severed body parts and go, I don't want to deal with this. And I've got all the verses to justify not dealing with it. But when I look at all the sin and the shallow Christianity and all this stuff going on in my life, I realize that that's the Holy Spirit's way of saying, come back and let's deal with these things. Let's apply the blood of Christ and the power of the empty tomb to those thoughts, to those 911s in your life, that I only sovereignly allowed that to happen so I could show myself God in your life. You chose to be God yourself with all the medicating. The fasting has exposed that. You're in a perfect prime place right now to deal with some of this stuff. And I'm not trying to tell you guys that tonight when we pray, man, everyone's fixed. Every, I mean, life is a journey of healing. Do you know that? It's not like a one time you flip the switch and you're done. If that's the case, we could all go to heaven now, right? But I'm interested in just that one touch, that one moment, that one encounter with Jesus where all of a sudden I see his grace and his love and acceptance in a particular area of my life that gives me hope for all the other the other eight months that I need to walk this road because he wants to walk it with us. How glorious is that, amen? I want to share with you a scripture. Stand to your feet. Listen to this. Ephesians chapter 4, the scripture says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they close their minds and harden their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy family of the world runs and they're desensitized to the pain and the problems and they're doing all they can do to fill that emptiness. That's how the world acts. It's not how we act as Christians. When God brings us, like Mary and Martha, a dead brother, something in our lives that we want to quickly go, God, I don't understand if you loved me, how could you? He wants us at that moment to say, God, I worship you. I trust you. I'm pouring out all I value and all I hold a value in my life at your feet. And I promise you, at moments like that, the Spirit of God comes and does something miraculous in our life. And then we finish a journey like this and we go, it wasn't just 30 days my life has been changed because now I can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If it's a day of darkness, he's God. If it's a day of light, he's God. If I've given me a brand new child, blessed be the name of the Lord. If I've lost someone I love, blessed be the name of the Lord. If I got a raise, blessed be the name of the Lord. If all of us and I lost my job and I'm in hardship and I have to trust him, blessed be the name of the Lord. Folks, that's discipleship. That's real discipleship. And it begins with breaking out the worship in the midst of death. Jesus, to this we know we're called. And so many of us in this room have run 
from such worship, from such trust. We've waited to feel it before we faith it. So tonight, Spirit of the living God, we welcome you to come and stir within our spirit to break out the perfume, to break out the fragrance that we can fill the room with by trusting you as Job did, as worshiping you as your servant Paul in the inner cell, beaten and bloody and bruised and blessed your name. We know such an atmosphere, Holy Spirit, you're attracted to. So we come tonight as your sons and daughters, willing to walk such a road, a Calvary road with you. So we welcome you in this time of prayer to move in our thoughts, to inspire our thoughts, that we could release the courage and the trust with the fruit of our lips to worship you because God, simply, you're worthy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Family, we're going to take the next 20 minutes or so and, and break up into groups of three or four. Try that and no more. As you pray, let me keep your attention before you break up. This is key right now. This is not a time of fellowship. We want to invite the Holy Spirit to move with an anointing in this room. Amen? And we don't want to grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. We do that by leaving the flow of God's Spirit. You sense where God is leading right now. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the desert. You hear where he's calling you to go. It's not a time to sit there and talk about something worldly or carnal or shallow. It's time to jump in the deep end. You might say, but I don't know how to swim. Perfect. God's going to keep you from drowning. Jump in the deep end. Keep it horizontal, momentarily go vertical. If you're not sure what to pray, be still before the Lord in that circle of prayer and just wait. God's going to bring a word. He's going to bring a scripture verse to somebody. If you, and this is so important. If you sense for any moment that God is stirring your heart and you just think you're going to weep, don't resist the Holy Spirit moving in you like that. Don't worry about what people will think in the circle next to you. Who cares? There's always going to be a Judas to say, oh, they're overly emotional. They're putting on a show to draw attention to themselves. There'll always be someone to do that. Be a Mary and don't care. Just care about Jesus that's right before you because he wants to do business in this place tonight. Amen? Let's do just that, family. Let's spend some time in prayer together.